You got uh, Tony Aloysius Gripshover. Anthony Aloysius is a German name, which means fame and war. He uh, was born on May 19th, 1955, and he died November 22nd, 1973, in a car crash in Boone County, Kentucky. Uh, he would have been, well, I guess he is my uncle. He's my deceased uncle, Tony Gripshover. So the Gripshovers had come to America in 1869, and um, uh, yeah, they came. They came to America in 1869. They came from Germany or the German-speaking lands, at least. Uh, uh, there's a mixture. I have a mixture of bloodlines, but uh, mostly Prussian, uh, Bavarian, some Bohemian, some African, and uh, uh, and Austrian, uh, uh, major uh, uh, Austrian bloodline too. So, you know, and Austrians would be considered German under the all-encompassing ethnic term of German, which is the language and the ethnicity of uh, some of the European Americans here in Kentucky, United States, especially in Louisville and Cincinnati. So, okay, the 1990 U.S. Census indicated that close to 60 million Americans reported that they were of German descent, thereby making German Americans the largest single ethnic group in the United States. In the United States, in 23 states of the Union, they form at least 20% of the population, and they're the largest single group in those particular states. These states stretch from Pennsylvania in the east across the Midwest and the Great Plains all the way to Oregon and Washington in the west, uh, forming what has become known as the German Belt. In his book, A Nation of Immigrants, 1964, President Kennedy highlighted some of the influences and contributions that German Americans have made in the last four centuries. Among them are uh, were the following. Almost every state has profited from German Americans' intellectual and material contributions. In Louisville, the uh, uh, statue for Fountain Square was built by a German American. The suspension bridge, the Ro Roebling suspension bridge, um, which is uh, uh, a precursor to the Brooklyn Bridge. So Germans are responsible for the Brooklyn Bridge and for the Roebling Bridge. Uh, they own some of the uh, major coal mines in eastern Kentucky. Uh, William Justice Goebel, the, some of the, the most pol uh, biggest politicians, they uh, mostly fought for the Union. Um, they lived in Cincinnati and uh, Louisville. They made a, a indelible mark in, here in Louisville. Um, just uh, Butcher Town is actually where the 1855 riots started. The Catholic Church is largely established uh, by the German American community. So uh, there used to be a, a bunch of German newspapers here in Louisville. Now we just have one daily newspaper. Um, but before, uh, there used to be a whole bunch uh, of newspapers here in Louisville. Until the propaganda campaign of World War One and World War Two, so lots of intellectual and material contributions in rural areas. They pioneered scientific farming, uh, crop rotation, and soil conservation. So crop rotation, rotating your crops so that way all the soil um, nutrients are evenly distributed and they're not being uh, taken out by one main crop like you know, raising corn on the exact same plot of ground over and over again, I think depletes the nitrogen, I want to say, uh, and soil conservation, so not allowing erosion, making sure that there's grass and seed that's planted um, in between plantings. So, uh, in urban areas, they entered the ranks of educators and engineers, scientists, and artists. They established industrial enterprises in the field of lumbering, food processing, brewing, so lots of beer, uh, even Coors and Budweiser are German uh, German beers. So um, steel making, making steel is Germans, electrical engineering, uh, LCD screens is uh, by made by 
the German people, a lot of cars, the Volkswagen, I would say Audi, Mercedes Benz, Porsche, maybe. I don't, I'm not for sure exactly on the cars, but there are a lot of popular cars are made by Germans. Um, piano making, railroading, printing, publishing, and more. John F. Kennedy noted that American society owes the mellowing of the Puritan influence to the German-American concept of the Continental Sunday. So the Puritans actually had made Christmas illegal. If you were caught celebrating Christmas, uh, you were fined five shillings or uh, something like that. They were, they, they were fined because the Puritans were, you know, very prudish. Um, and the Germans brought some flavor. Their Catholic religion, where they are allowed to drink alcohol, where the kids, at least they sip alcohol, the wine, uh, which uh, uh, transforms into the blood of Christ, right? So, the. Uh, <laughs> and Christmas, where they celebrate it and they have presents and gift uh, wrapping and giving and, you know, having a party and just having fun. So the celebration of Christmas and the New Year was mainly shaped by German Americans, the presence of a symphony orchestra. So the symphony orchestras in most large cities is a German American invention and community singing and glee clubs derived from the German singing societies. In the area of education, German Americans helped form the American education system as we know it today. They introduced kindergarten. Kindergarten, you know, before first grade, the first one, before Head Start, I guess after Head Start. Uh, but kindergarten, you know, five-year-old, when I was five years old, I went to kindergarten. And kindergarten was started by a German-American, actually by the wife of a famous German-American. I think Margaret Schertz, Margaret Schertz, short shirts. So uh, they introduced kindergarten to prepare children for schooling. They promoted state-sponsored universities. Uh, which was based on the German model of the university. So all university, uh, state-sponsored universities, uh, they're set up uh, based upon the German model of the university. UK, Western, uh, Eastern Kentucky University, University of Louisville, Northern Kentucky University, uh, Kentucky State College, all universities are based on well, I don't want to say, yeah, yeah, I guess all universities are based on the German model of the un university. Most of them. I would, I'll say most of them. I guess for all statements, all you got to do is just find one example. So, you know, the state-sponsored university, as long as the state is given the university funds, uh, it's a state-sponsored university, and that is based on the German model. So, German-Americans also introduced physical education into public schools. So PE, they made sure that the uh, young people were getting their exercise and making sure that the, their body, uh, their bodily kinesthetic intellectual capabilities were being utilized. So uh, physical education into public schools and also pioneered German instruction by means of the first bilingual programs in the country. American English, as H.L. Mencken, the German-American sage of Baltimore, once wrote, varies greatly from European English, and this is due in no small part to German-Americans, whose German language has greatly influenced English as it is spoken in the United States today. Uh, German words are not only common, but an integral part of the daily vocabulary, giving us such words as hamburger and frankfurter and delicatessen, delicatessen. Delicatessen, so which I don't really use, but there's also other German words. There's uh, uh, Frankfurt, Frankfurt, Kentucky is from the city Frankfurt in Germany. So there's Frankfurt Avenue, and there's a lot of German street names here in Louisville. Um, German words in the English language. Kindergarten, that's a that's a, a big German word. So. Such a large ethnic group would, of course, uh, Doppler radar. Yeah, uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, we measure our temperature in Fahrenheit degrees. Um, you know, so I keep my uh, temperature on 77. That's uh, the AC. I keep it on 77 Fahrenheit. So Fahrenheit is a German word. 
So by having such a large ethnic group would, of course, uh, gain political influence. Indeed, in 1688, German Americans in Germantown, Pennsylvania, issued the first protest against slavery. So the first major colony, I want to say the first colony by Francis Daniel Pastorius um, in Germantown, Pennsylvania, 1688. They issued the first protest against slavery. German Americans issued the first protest against slavery. Okay, we don't like slavery. We're against slavery. Germans, we don't, we don't, um, we don't like the militarism uh, of of Germany. That's why we immigrated. That's why we came here. We were either running from Otto uh, von Bismarck or the eighteen, the failed eighteen forty eight revolutions inspired by Karl Marx, a German American. Albert Einstein, a German American. So, uh, German Americans have been actively involved in American politics at all levels, including William Justice Goebel, a German American, a German Kentuckian, um, who uh, he came to Kentucky in Covington as a child, as a young person, I want to say six to ten years old. So he's he's Kentucky. He's Covington, Kentucky. You know, he's German American, which they didn't like the nativist, the Confederate nativist, uh, the Protestant uh, Confederate nativist. They didn't, they didn't like the German Catholics, nor or the Irish. So both the Catholics and the Irish were treated like the Mexicans are treated today uh, in this country. They, they're taking our jobs right. They're, they speak a different language. They got a different culture. They stick to themselves. All those things can be said true of the German Americans. They spoke a different language. They have a different culture. Uh, they kept to themselves. So the I think the comparison to say that Germans and Irish that immigrated into America uh, were treated initially like the Mexican uh, immigrants are treated today. So in times of war, even during trying times of world wars against Germany, against their mother country, uh, Germans still were at the forefront, uh, fighting their patriotic duty, uh, fighting for America, fighting for you know freedom and justice, anti-tyranny, anti-fascism, anti-totalitarianism. So, John F. Kennedy's introductory survey was important for two reasons. First, it signified a long overdue recognition of the role played by German Americans, America's largest ethnic group in American history. Second, Kennedy's survey not only provides us with a brief overview of the German American experience, but also serves as a convenient point of departure for an introduction to this history of the German Americans. So, uh, just uh, again, 1688, 1688, German Americans were the first white people that issued a protest against slavery in Germantown, Pennsylvania, 1688. That had been uh, Francis Daniel Pastoris's people. So German-American history begins in 1608 with the arrival of the first permanent German settlers at Jamestown, Virginia. However, any discussion of the beginnings of German-American history must include reference to any and all possible precursors and contacts between America and Germany. The earliest possible connection is found in the realm of Germanic legend, uh, where Turker, Tyker, where Tyker was the first German in America. Additionally, Germans played an additional role in the discovery and exploration of America in the 15th and 16th centuries prior to the Jamestown settlement, which cannot be overlooked. According to Germanic legend, Tyker, a German explorer, Tyker, uh, Tyker, Tyker, reached North America around the year 1000, or close to five centuries before Christopher Columbus. At that time, the Norsemen, or Vikings, led by Leif Erikson, reached the New World, where they attempted to establish several colonies, one of which was Vinland, Wineland. The exact location of these settlements are unknown. However, it is felt that Vinland was probably located in Newfoundland's northern shore at a site known as La Anse aux Meadows, L-A-N-S-E-A-U-X Meadows. A company, Erickson was Norse leader's own foster father, Turker, Tyker, dang it, Tyker, Tyke. There's a Turk, Turker. It's got to be Turker. You know? Turker, Turker, a German, Turker, 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 Durker, 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 Turker, 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 Tur
Turker, a German, according to legend, he was the first German to reach America. Furthermore, he was credited with having discovered grapes on the new land and with having named this new land Vinland. Norse saga provides us with the following account of this legendary first German in America and his discovery. So, it's 15 minutes. I'll read some more here in a minute. 